1966, when this terrifying apparition was seen by two boys, James Yankitis and Marvin Munoz, as they were walking home along a desolate stretch adjacent to the New Jersey Turnpike. The lucky boys managed to run for safety. Perhaps the most famous example of this phenomenon, however, comes to us in the form of on Indrid Cold, who was said to have terrified Mothman eyewitnesses in Point Pleasant, Virginia during the same year. Zanfretta swore that the sound of the outlandish individual's voice physically compelled him to obey the request that would come next. Apparently, the voice, which may or may not have been telepathic as is often the case in Grinning Man scenarios, ordered him to drive his vehicle into a small cloud that was hovering just above the ground. Zanfretta did as he was instructed and claims that he and his patrol car were levitated within the cloud and deposited onto a huge spacecraft. On board the ship the guard was allowed to explore with the company of the oversized aliens. Within the colossal craft, Zanfretta claimed to have seen large, transparent cylinders filled with a weird blue liquid. One of the cylinders was said to have contained a frog-shaped body, which the aliens explained was an enemy of ours from another planet. Perhaps this was one of the same technologically advanced, self-illuminated wand-waving species that the aquatic enigmas, known as the Loveland Frogmen, belonged to. In two other cylinders, Zanfretta observed a large bird-like creature and another humanoid figure that he described as looking like a caveman. Around this time these mystifying beings attempted to give Zanfretta a transparent sphere with what appeared to be an electrically charged pyramid inside. The aliens claimed that beings to comprehend who they were and how they lived. Zanfretta tried to refuse the gift, stating that, had enough of all these strange encounters and wished only go back to his normal life. Nevertheless, the creatures insisted he accept it, informing him that he was to give the sphere to a man of whose name he had never heard before, noted American scientist and UFO researcher Dr. J. Allen Hynek. Zanfretta, for reason only clear to him, claims that instead of giving this prize to the now-deceased Heineck, he hid the object somewhere in the hills near Genoa. Zanfretta disappeared again on February 14, 1980, after which he was found by his colleagues in a state of shock and suffering from mild hypothermia. A villager living nearby stated that mere minutes before the rescuers arrived, he spied a huge, radiant mass in the sky. During the next hypnosis session, Dr. Moretti found Zanfretta to be uncharacteristically incooperative. While hypnotized, he claimed he was contacting the aliens and began to speak an odd, unknown language. His voice became guttural and he uttered cryptic phrases like, question with negative answer, tixel, dot you can't work out anything in a case like this. To believe or not to believe doesn't mean anything, each thing in its own time. Against all odds, Zanfretta managed to vanish yet again on August 13, 1980. But this time, he was under close observation and was found before the aliens could contact him. This was the end of his ordeal, at least until recently, when the now long-retired security guard claimed the extraterrestrials reinitiated contact. To what end remains to be seen? In 1984, Rino Di Stefano wrote a book about these enigmatic events entitled, The Zanfretta Case, which details the harrowing events that took place between 1978 and 1980. That same year, the Italian State National Broadcasting Network, Rai TV, made a two-part docudrama based on the book. Portions of the unfortunately unsubtitled film can be seen above. While there can be little doubt that the purported series of events that took place near Torilia, Italy borders on the absurd, one cannot dismiss the fact that there were over 60 additional witnesses to this strange aerial phenomenon and at least one poor soul who lost his life because of it. To this day the perplexing case of Pier Fortunato Zanfretta remains the most famous account of an alien abduction ever to hail from Italy. But as frightening as this case is, an excerpt from one of Night Watchman's hypnotic recollections, in the form of a warning he seemed to be giving to the aliens, might paint a more optimistic picture of the intentions of these visitors. I know you are trying to come more frequently. No, you can't come to Earth. People get scared if they look at you. You can't make friendship. <laughs> No. 
vengono molto lontano no non vogliono che io lo dica non vogliono I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes midnight central time. Greetings and be in when you made the crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video then feel free to subscribe. Vile vortices. Definition 1. Vile it. Plural of villi meaning miserable. 2. Vortices it. Plural of vortici meaning whirl or vortex. Explaining the vile vortices. By definition, the vile vortices would be miserable whirlers but actually they are 12 vertex points of a planetary grid see figure 1, originally plotted by Ivan T. Sanderson, a naturalist and paranormal investigator. Sanderson first coined the term, vile vortices, in his article, The Twelve Devil's Graveyards Around the World, Saga Magazine, 1972. The best known vile vortices are the Bermuda Triangle, the Dragon's Triangle, Devil's Sea, and the South Atlantic Anomaly. However, each of these 12 geographic areas is credited with instances of magnetic anomalies and other unexplained phenomena. Plotting the vile vortices. Ivan T. Sanderson, the founder of the Society for the Investigation of the Unexplained, was avidly interested in investigating ship and plane disappearances linked to the paranormal. In the late 60s he focused his attention on 10 areas that were approximately equidistant and were the subjects of reported unexplained incidents and or electromagnetic distortions. 10 of Sanderson's vile vortices are located in the Earth's tropical climates, 5 of them fall within the Tropic of Cancer and the other 5 within the Tropic of Capricorn. The remaining 2 vile vortices are located at the North and South Poles. Together the vile vortices form the vertices of an icosahedron, a 20-faced polyhedron. Sanderson theorized that hot and cold air and sea currents crossing these lozenge-shaped areas might create the electromagnetic anomalies responsible for the disappearances of planes and sea-going vessels and the reported mechanical and instrument malfunctions in these areas. Merging the vile vortices into the planetary grid. In 1973, three Soviet scientists Nikolai Goncharov, Vyacheslav Morachov, and Valery Makarov extended Sanderson's theory in their article, Is the Earth a Large Crystal?, published in a Soviet science magazine. They postulated that a matrix of cosmic energy made up of 12 the article claimed that the junctions of any three of these plates 62 junctions in all possessed unusual properties such as advanced prehistoric cultures, unique wildlife, or other mysterious phenomena. The work of the Russian scientists outlined a planetary grid that built on Sanderson's original 12 vile vortices, overlapping Sanderson's icosahedron with a combination of icosahedrons and dodecahedrons in parallel with many of the Earth's seismic fracture zones, ocean ridges and additionally portrayed the Earth's atmospheric highs and lows, routes used by migratory animals, and gravitational anomalies as well as the locations of ancient civilizations. However, planetary grid systems date back to the time of Plato, approximately, 427 to 347 BCE. Plato theorized that the Earth's basic structure evolved from simple to complex geometric shapes, the cube, tetrahedron, three sides, the octahedron, eight, the icosahedron, 20, and dodecahedron, 12, known today as the platonic solids. 
He associated four of the five shapes with, respectively, the elements of earth, fire, air, and water and the dodecahedron with the earth's prana, ether, life-sustaining force. David Hatcher Childress, author of Mapping the World Grid observes, we are speaking about an intelligent geometric pattern into which, theoretically, the earth and its energies are organized, and possibly in which the ubiquitous megalithic sites are also positioned. Hollow Weldon and the Bennington Triangle I'm going to hike on the long trail. These words were the last that anyone heard from Paulo Weldon, the now legendary Bennington College student who disappeared mysteriously 68 years ago. Her story is without a doubt Bennington's most infamous unsolved mystery, and one that continues to appear in New England authors' histories of the occult and unexplained. December 1, 1946, began like any other day in Bennington for Paula Weldon, an 18-year-old sophomore at the college. She worked two shifts at the school's dining hall, came back to her room and conversed for a while with her roommate, Elizabeth Johnson. Then, she told Johnson, I'm all through with studies, I'm taking a long walk, and headed out around 2.45 p.m., according to Johnson's recollections. She was wearing a distinctive red coat with a fur collar, jeans and lightweight sneakers. Given that it was a cold, though snowless day, and the temperatures were predicted to be subfreezing by nightfall, she seemed either underdressed for a walk in the woods or was only planning to be out for a short while. That is only one of the unsolved mysteries surrounding Weldon's appearance and behavior that fateful November day. Shortly thereafter, a blonde, slight, red coat-clad young woman was seen by Danny Fager, the owner of a gas station that at the time was across the street from the college gates. Fager said the girl ran up the side of a gravel pit near the college entrance, then ran down it again. Then she went out of view. Later, search parties would call in a bulldozer to sift through the gravel pit on the off chance that she had been buried alive. No evidence was found. Just before 3 p.m., Lewis Knapp of Woodford picked up a girl hitchhiking on Route 67A just outside the college entrance. His description of her matched Weldon. When climbing into his truck, the girl nearly slipped, and Knapp warned her, be careful. No further words were spoken between them until Knapp led her off near his driveway, which was on Route 9 near the Long Trail, where the girl had told him she wanted to go. After thanking Knapp for the ride, Weldon headed for the trail. The next sighting of the girl was roughly 45 minutes later in Bickford Hollow, where several residents reported seeing her headed to the trail. One was Ernie Whitman, a watchman for the Banner, who warned her about heading up into the mountains dressed so lightly and at such a late hour. She continued on anyway, into the woods, and out of sight forever. Night fell, and there was no sign of Weldon anywhere. Johnson, her roommate, was reportedly very nervous, but chose not to inform college authorities until the next morning, when college president Lewis Webster Jones was notified of Weldon's disappearance. He in turn called Weldon's parents to see if she had gone home for the weekend. Weldon's mother reportedly collapsed from shock and was confined to her bed, while her father, W. Archibald, headed straight for Bennington from their Stamford, Connecticut, home to commence a search for their missing daughter. Weldon's father arrived in Bennington and immediately organized a large group of volunteers from all corners of the community, including local residents and members of both Bennington College and Williams College. Classes at Bennington were suspended so that all students could participate in the search. By the evening of December 2, however, the college students had reportedly become frustrated with what they saw.